welcome everybody. Let's come in and stand together. As we enter into a time of worship, I'm gonna read a passage out of Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, the curtain that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts, sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And church, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let's worship together.
sin. Well, he is our hope and he is, is who we fix our eyes on um, because it is not in our own strength that we are saved, church. Amen. Has anybody else found that to be true? You worked real hard, got yourself out of need for salvation. Anybody out there? Um, so I'm going to do something that I didn't know that I was going to be able to do. Um, I'm going to share a song that I wrote with you guys. Uh, it's a worship song that we used to sing at my last church. And uh, when I came here, uh, I made a point that I wasn't just going to force old wine into new wineskins. Um, but in the last several weeks, there has been this passage that has continually come up that we're going to share uh, here in a few weeks in our seek night um, that I feel like the Lord is doing something with and um, it keeps pulling me back into this song and it's uh, to give you a little bit of context. I wrote this song um, out of sitting down watching a Disney show with my kids called Sophia the First. And if you've ever seen this show, then you know, but if you have not, the idea is there's this woman who's a widowed woman with her daughter and one day the king of the whole area meets this woman and adopts this girl and marries this woman. And all of a sudden, these two bakers are sitting at the king's table. And the Lord just like flipped a switch in my mind and was like, this is your invitation. You were far off and I brought you in. And I didn't just bring you into my family, I brought you to my table to sit with me, to commune with me. We're gonna take communion in a, li in a little while at the end of the, uh, the gathering. Um, but the reason why I wanted to share this song with you is because I wrote this song as a reminder to me that it's his righteousness alone that draws me in, that it's his word alone that I have to, to hold on to, and it's his salvation that really puts me right. And when all those things work right, guess what that means for me? That I get to sit at his table because it is a privilege to know the King. And that's the name of this song. And so um, it is my offering to the Lord and before you this morning. And my hope is, is that it just encourages you in the God that we serve and that he has invited not just me, but anyone in this place. He has invited you to the table to dine with him, to know him and to worship him. Amen, church. And so if you catch it, you catch the melody, feel free to join and sing. But if not, just let it minister to your heart. I wrote it in the third person to remind me because I'm a dummy sometimes. And so let it just be an encouragement to you here this morning.
life by the Father's hand. His word is enough for them to endure till the end. Yes, true. up, we lift our hands, we lift our song.
sing it out. Jesus, you do deserve it all. You gave your own life and died so that we might live. You fill us with your spirit. You love us unconditionally. You always keep your promises, God. The list goes on and on and on of the reason that you are the only one worthy and deserving of our praise. So we come this morning, Lord, in holy reverence, lifting up your name, God. And we praise you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to 26 West Church. I can't believe a few weeks ago I was begging for it to rain and now it won't stop. So I guess I begged too hard. Um, but we're so glad that you're all here. Hopefully you're dry and a little more cozy. Um, kids, you can go ahead and head off to your class. Hope you have a great time. And let's say hello to the people around us. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. Take your time. Hang out. <laughs> How are you, Casey? <laughs> uh, good morning. Welcome, everyone, online and here in the building. My name is Jose, and you are none other than... Casey, Casey, Casey? Right. We'll get the mic working here in a second. Hey, uh, just as a reminder, friends, we're just going to update you on some things happening in the church. I do want to start with a good reminder. I was reading this week. It just happened to be my weekly Bible reading. Um, 1 Timothy 5. It says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything we need for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so they may take hold 
of the life that is truly life. I, I, it's hysterical that you can win $2 billion by figuring out a few numbers. It's just absolutely hysterical, and the craze around it. But in, it's funny, with the craze about uh, the Powerball and happen to be reading it this week, um, we are just a different people because we put our hope in God. And I just want to remind you, command those who are rich, that is every single one of us. Every one of us, even though there is inflation and even though things can get tight, when he's speaking to the rich, he's speaking to America. We have more resource than anyone in the world, probably in any generation in human history. And so the invitation to us is to be rich in good deeds. What can we do to bless other people and how can we live more generously? As a church, just to remind you, friends, um, all that happens here is as a result of God's people being generous consistently and joyfully. And so if this is your church home, we want to invite you unapologetically to give regularly. Uh, I would suggest as a practical rule, as often as God provides, release a portion of those funds back to his kingdom work for us. On staff here, it's once a month, so my giving generally is about once a month. As the Lord provides extra, we do extra. As God has given, so we give, and we're inviting you to do that, especially as we're moving towards the holiday season. Uh, we want to invite you as God's people to grow in generosity because Paul reminds the church, this is the biggest blessing for you because it reminds you our home is eternal, and right now as we give to God's work, we're preparing other people for eternity, and we're sending those gifts forward, literally. We're preparing a harvest that we're going to experience in the age to come when our Father says, well done, good and faithful servant. So grow in your generosity. If you've not yet started giving to your local church, I invite you to do it now. But giving is just one way that we can honor God. There's some other ways that we can honor Jesus and press into what he's doing. Yeah, so uh, some of you will have been here long enough to have been able to experience seek nights or worship nights. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I say that? Mm -hmm. Okay, Beth is ready to start one right now, <laughs> um, which is okay. We can do that. Um, but really, uh, one of the joys of my life is to have been called to be a worship pastor, and I really, really love what I get to do because there's something special that happens when God's people meet to lift up his name and to honor who he is together. Uh, and each week we have the opportunity over a few moments together, right? Of, about an hour where we get to hear Jose bring a word, but then also where we get to sing together. And a seek night is gonna be useful for a lot of different things in the rhythm of our church. But what it's gonna consistently be, my picture for you is it's a deep inhale together where we're inhaling the presence of God together. We're sitting in his presence inhaling his goodness together. And then as we leave, we have been filled up to be poured out. But what happens in those spaces will be a longer time for us to gather and worship, to pray, uh, to really seek God's face together, to, to hear from him, to listen. Um, and so we're gonna do our first one November 20th, the next first one, November 20th at six o'clock. It'll be here, we're really excited. Um, and what we're going to do is if you have little, little kids, like baby kids, then we'll have some people that will be able to watch. But for everybody else, we want to invite those kids to come in and, yeah. and, and worship with us. We, um, one of the things that's new since I've been here, but it's really valuable, is having kids in this space to worship because they need to learn. And sometimes they're not going to learn unless we, their parents, show them. Um, so anyway, so we want to invite you November 20th at 6 o'clock to come be a part of our first long, deep breath together as a family in his presence, breathing it in, and then being sent out, poured out into our communities, into our families. So I want to invite you to that. That's so good. And, and Casey, you're going to be leading that. But really, this is not just another teaching in the evening with a few more songs. The whole night is set apart. And our team has been praying now for weeks and months, Lord, what would you want us to know about yourself? that night. So please come expectant. Every one of you is invited to come and we're expecting that you'll be here at six o'clock. We physically waited to the community groups are done so that we don't stack too much in a given week. So it's the week after community groups are done, Sunday night, November the 20th. It's going to be amazing. Thank you, Casey. Uh, one last reminder, uh, some of you, when you walked in, you saw that, that we are celebrating baptism today. And so there is someone who's prepared, who came to faith just this summer and wants to declare publicly that Jesus is their Lord. 
but maybe that has been your experience in your soul. You've, uh, you've received Jesus Christ, you've fallen in love with him, you started walking him with him, but you've never responded in obedience and baptism. It just so happens today's message is on baptism. Wow. And um, you're going to be invited to step into the waters as well. So your invitation, if you started following Jesus and you've not yet been baptized in waters, to hear the word of God and then respond with obedience. And we're going to open up and provide a way. We have extra towels and everything for you and a bathroom set aside for you to change when you leave. And when you get out, you're going to be wet anyway. So you might as well be wet with obedience and, and then go home wet, wet. All right. Let's pray and um, let's just uh, jump in. Lord, we thank you. This is the day that you've made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in you. Now, God, open our eyes to see beautiful things that are in your word. There are things that you've written, spoken down through the ages. And some of us, we've read them but not understood them. Or some of us, we've read and understood part of it, but the fullness isn't there yet. And so, Holy Spirit of God, thank you that you came to awaken our senses to the presence and the teaching and the life of Jesus. And Jesus, as we, as we talk about you, I pray your realness would be known because you have sent the Spirit. And Father, we love you. Thank you for sending the Son. Thank you for sending the Spirit. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for working in us, bringing us back from darkness and into light, from death into life, from hopelessness into a living hope because our life is grounded in you. So God, open us and awaken us to you and your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. How do we know the nearness of God? Uh, we had a question. We're doing these Q&As. You can always ask a question about the Holy Spirit. And someone asked, and I won't fully answer today. Uh, but the question came something to the effect of, I've, I've known God's presence in the Holy Spirit before, but now he seems so far away. How do I get that back? It's an honest and valid question. How do we know the nearness of God? We've been doing uh, or started a long series in the Holy Spirit to discover what God has already told us about himself. And really, the person of the Spirit brings about the nearness of God. So if, if you're new, we're looking at the Holy Spirit in three movements and taking our time. This first movement is about the Holy Spirit who is above. What does it mean that we say that the Holy Spirit is? is God and above and not just ordinary? How is he unique? And then in the new year, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit who's within. Jesus said the Father is going to send the Spirit and he is going to be in you. What does it mean to be filled and to be constantly in connection with the Holy Spirit in day-to-day -day life. And then by the end, as we move towards Easter and forward, we want to see how the Holy Spirit wants to empower us uh, to work through us to do his good pleasure. Uh, we saw last week, we went from the Old Testament to now looking at the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. And we saw last week that, that the Holy Spirit brought about the birth of the Son. God had always planned to send his Messiah. How did he do it? The Holy Spirit somehow conceived in the womb of Mary, the Son of God. The Spirit is at work. Now, that's great, and that's history, and that's unique, and that's never happened again, and will never happen again. But what does that have to do with day-to-day -day life? We realize that the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit who is bringing about the birth, the physical birth of Jesus, now is here to bring about our rebirth. When you respond to the good news of Jesus and say, Jesus, rescue me, in a moment, you are regenerated. Regenerated is a theological term. I like regenerated because it speaks to what happens. Your spiritual DNA is remade by God. You don't see it, but you know that it's true. You were dead to the presence of God in his fullness because he is holy. But somehow within, you have been made right with God, peace with God. You've been given a new heart. You've been given a new mind. You've been given a new creation. The old is gone. The Bible says the new has come. And what you will be in the future when you and I are with Jesus together forever, you are experiencing in part right now. The Bible uses a phrase that has been made fun of in our culture because we're goofy people sometimes. You have been born again. 
Who wants to use that tag? It just sounds, it's so loaded in our culture when people think about what those born-again Christians are like. But you may make fun of the caricature, but you got to realize that's exactly what Jesus promised would happen. You and I, in our faith in Jesus, have been made born again. All right, so we're new. Jesus was born. He grew. And then the gospel skipped most of his life. Isn't that weird? All you get about Jesus is he's born, he's sent out to Egypt because his life is on the line, he makes his way back to Nazareth, and then you get one glimpse, he's at the temple as a young person, and he's wowing everybody because he knows the Bible as if he read it and wrote it. He, he's confounding people. And they're like, who is this? And he says to his parents, hey, what are you worried about? I'm in my father's house. Ooh. And then you get Jesus teaching, doing the work of the kingdom, miracles, raising the dead to life, and then he gives his life away. But before that, we're going to look at a glimpse. Before any of Jesus' stuff happens, something unique takes place, and we're going to look at that this morning. Jesus is baptized. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record it. They all give us a glimpse, and this is going to be fun because we're going to look at all four because they give us some unique things that if, if we didn't have Mark and we didn't have Luke or we didn't have John, there's some little nuggets that you and I would miss and we don't want to. Let's just look at all four and then we want to think about baptism. There's the baptism of Jesus. There's our baptism. How are they the same? How are they different? Why does it matter? Hang in there. Matthew chapter 3 is where we'll begin. Go to Matthew chapter 3 in your Bible or in your app or look up at that screen. Matthew 3 verse 13 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Then here's a unique thing, verse 15. Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness, then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, and I'll have to go deep because God's voice is deep. We saw that last week. This is my son, whom I love. I don't know if that's what God sounds like. With him, I am well pleased. What do we see that's unique in Matthew? Every one of the Gospels give us a little insight. Most carry the same information. Here's what we learn from Matthew. A couple of things, too. One, John the Baptist recognizes who Jesus is. Jesus does not need to be baptized. And you say, Jose, followers of Jesus need to be baptized, but Jesus didn't need to be baptized. What's up with that? Well, we'll get to that in a few minutes. You just need to remember that the Holy Spirit, the series is on the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving insight into John, who's the baptizer. Remember, we saw last week that Zechariah was promised that this son of yours is going to be filled with the Spirit from the womb. God's speaking voice. The Spirit is going to come and speak through your son, John the Baptist, who will be like Elijah, not Elijah the ancient prophet reincarnated, but come in the ministry and in the work. And Elijah spoke the word of God and the people could follow the ways of God. Now John the Baptist is coming and he's going to speak the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. So John came with a message of repentance and he called the people, turn back to God, turn back to his word, turn back to his ways, and he baptized them which I don't know about you, brings up all sorts of questions. Why is John washing people? Going into the water, and if you go to the Holy Land, we hope to take a trip as a church, Lord willing, in 18 months or so, we have to work out the days, but you'll see that there's the River Jordan and people go in and under the water. To be, what, what was that all about? Now, water and the Bible, there's all sorts of history. I'm just going to give you a little rabbit trail for a second. John is calling people to, in their heart, turn back to God. But when they do that, they're to express a sign. Water 
and repentance, water and turning, water and new life. Well, this goes back to the Bible. When God's people were enslaved in, in Egypt and God delivered them, and remember he sent Moses, I'm going to rescue my people, Moses, and I want you to be a spokesperson. And they, they reach the Red Sea and they're stuck and they're going to be defeated by the enemy. And what does God do? He brings them through the water on dry ground and God's people are literally saved as through the water. And then the enemies of God who refuse to repent, they are destroyed. So there is a picture all throughout the Bible of water being this external sign that we have been made new, rescued, loved, brought back to life by God. And then in the, in the law of Moses, God brings them to the mountain, speaks the words of instruction for God's people on the mountain. And if you read uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, you're going to see a lot of things God's people are to do as they worship God and come into his presence in the right way. And water is one of those major ways. I'll just read one. I won't bother putting it on screen. Numbers 19, 11 through 12. Quote, this is how you'd approach God. Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean, and then it says, for seven days. They must purify themselves with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, and then they'll be made clean. If they do not purify themselves on the third and seventh days, they will not be clean. When you went into God's presence, there were things you could touch or do that would make you unclean, unfitting for the presence of God. And is it God wants to push people away? No, but God gives us visual reminders. He's not like us. We're made in his image, but he's holy and pure and unlike anyone else. And to come into God's presence we ought to be respectful and ready. We ought to prepare our hearts so when people touch things that were defiling and unclean, God provided a pathway. Wash. Let the external sign of washing remind you God is holy. There's no one like him. And then water, that's just one example. There's lots. Uh, often the Jewish people, especially even around the time of Jesus, when you come towards the temple courts, there were these places where you would wash yourself. It's just a reminder. I come in physically dirty, but in my heart, in my soul, I'm unclean because of my sinfulness. But there were ceremonial washings that you would walk into, and in the waters you're saying, Lord, I want you to make me clean. I know you for who you are. I want to come in your presence and hear me. He's not excluding us. He's inviting us. But he's inviting us to come through the waters. Okay, fast forward. By the, by the time of Jesus, when someone who was not born in the Jewish faith, they wanted to enter into the family of God. They wanted to come in God's covenant agreement. What would they do? You know what they would do? If you were born Gentile, non-Jew, and you wanted to become one of God's people, the external sign was water baptism. You were baptized into the community of faith, and it was your external sign to say, God, I, I want to be welcomed in your family. I am washed, and now I'm made clean, and now I can go to temple. Now I can go and worship you. Now I can offer the sacrifices. Now I can sing your praises. I'm included, and I'm included because of the water. And then for God's people, they would wash. They would wash before they were eating a meal. Out of thanksgiving to God for all that he had provided, but I want to clean myself. I want to come and ready to be thankful for all that God has done. Water, 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 water. I just want to remind you, because some of us, we don't know the Bible well, that when we look at the baptism of John, it's not coming out of nowhere. John is simply pulling on all of the Bible and what the Spirit of God had revealed, that when God is doing a transforming work in our heart, we can respond in a right way, and the right way is to show externally what God was doing internally. So two things I said, that was a rabbit trail, two things I said that we get from, from Matthew. One, John the Baptist knew who this Messiah was that Jesus was uniquely qualified. He did not need the water. Jesus did not need to be baptized. He didn't need to be included in the family of God. He's the son of God. He didn't need to be washed from any unholy thing. He didn't need to be prepared to be in God's presence. John the Baptist knew by the Spirit of God that everyone 
in the Old Testament who had been promising Messiah was to come, Jesus is, in fact, that person. Second thing we know from Matthew is that Jesus is baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus says, hey, John, I know who I am. I don't need to be baptized, but I want to fulfill all that is right. What, is, what does it mean that Jesus wanted to fulfill all, all righteousness? I think two things at least. The first is Jesus wanted to identify with us. Jesus is fully God, absolutely. Born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yet he is fully man. And he'd come to stand in our place and on the cross provide our rescue, right? But before he does that, in his baptism, he doesn't need it, but he's saying, I'm going to step into the waters because every other person needs to step into the waters. And I want to show, even though I'm without sin, without blemish, without shame, I am here standing with you. Now, when we think about that, we realize we ought to be grateful that Jesus did that. Because I can come now to Jesus with all of my issues, with all of my problems, with all of my shortcomings. When we think about approaching God before the coming of Jesus, there's holy reverence and awe. Rightfully, I stand away. If I've done ceremonially unclean things, I need to make myself right. And I need to provide all these pathways so I can enter God's presence. But when Jesus arrives, everything changes. God has now come And he's identifying with us. He is not filled with sin, but he's willing to stand in the presence of sinners and to have a sinner, John the Baptist, although he was a holy person, he was not perfect. I will stand and allow you even to put me under the water. Jesus is not afraid to be with you. Jesus is not unacquainted with your mess up. He is not surprised by your failure He is not disappointed in the sense of, since you did A, I will now do B, or you can never have C. He loves us. Isn't this good news? In his baptism, Jesus is standing with us, and we know he's going to stand in our place in a few years on the cross. Second thing I think is Jesus lived in full obedience to the Father. Because this was the pathway for the people of God, Jesus shows and demonstrates active obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this ought to be a motivation for you and me when it comes to obeying what God has said. Jesus did not have to. He is God made flesh. But he submits himself under the leadership of the Father. He and the Father are one. Perfectly united. Yet Jesus submits to the will of the Father. That's what we get from Matthew. All right, Uh, let's look at Mark, Luke, and John. We'll do these a little more quickly. Mark, uh, Mark 1, 9 through 13 has the same uh, encounter with some unique twists. Verse 9, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Matthew said the same thing. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Same thing. And a voice came from heaven, you're my son, whom I love, with you I'm well pleased. Same thing. Verse 12 is is key for Mark. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended to him. What does Mark tell us? Verse 12, the, the sent out, the Spirit sent him into the wilderness, That's a a very mild English translation. You could say he drove him out, he cast him out, threw him out, hurled him out. When Jesus casts out demons from people, he uses this word, he rips them out. And Mark lets us know uniquely that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is taking Jesus in his active obedience, submission to the Father, and is moving him out to confront the enemy. We're going to look at that next week in detail, the time of Jesus in the desert and what the Holy Spirit does as we think about our seasons of desert and testing and trial and trouble and what the Holy Spirit does. We're going to do it in one week, but I realize that would be two hours and I love you too much, okay? So we're going to push that to next week.
But we know that Mark helps us know there's a reason for Jesus' baptism. He's going to be sent to confront and defeat the enemy on your behalf and on mine. All right, that's Mark. Luke, uh, Luke chapter 3, and into chapter 4 gives us the third movement. Again, similarities, and, and Luke is more of the summarizer. So let's just read it. Verse 21. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And then he gives like a genealogy. And then if you, if you just jump down to chapter 4 verse 1, we'll continue. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was, I'll just add some words, really, 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 really hungry. I mean, he's, he's hungry after the 40 days. Okay, so John, uh, Luke doesn't let us know anything about John the Baptist. Doesn't seem to be important in his account. But he keeps what the other Gospels share. And there are three things that he includes. But before we do that, a little helpful background. Why does any of this matter? Sometimes, because we don't know the Bible as well as others before us, we miss a point. The, the Old Testament ends with a prophet called Malachi. And at the time of Jesus, 400 plus years, could be 480, 400 plus years have passed, and there's no prophetic voice. There is no, thus, thus saith the Lord, to use King James language. There's no active Holy Spirit-inspired speech for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So the rabbis, around the time of Jesus, they came to the conclusion that at the end of Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, that the Holy Spirit left, that the glory of God left the temple, that the Spirit of God was no longer moving because of the rebellion and obstinate hearts, the resistance to God. As a result, God's glory had departed. The temple is still there, but the glory, the presence of, of God that God's people had experienced in powerful ways, it had, it had descended. But when Messiah returns, the glory of God, the presence of God will return to God's house. Okay, so what is happening at the baptism of Jesus. It seems like Jesus goes in the water, comes out, no big deal, no huge deal. Three things happen. Luke tells us what Mark tells us, what Matthew tells us. He kind of summarizes it. The Holy Spirit spent, descends on Jesus in a profound way. There's a, an imagery like a dove resting and coming on, on Jesus. The glory of God is returning to God's land. God's come back. But it's not just descending on the people. Who is it descending on? One person uniquely, on Jesus. And Jesus is going to be God's mouthpiece. In a way, John the Baptist was in small part. He says, I'm not even worthy to untie or tie this person's sandals. He came to prepare the way for the Messiah. And now in the baptism of Jesus, it becomes open public news God's presence has returned. The second thing is the Father speaks to the Son, I'm well pleased with you, which sounds like really cool. Like Dad says to boy, man, good job, Jesus. No, no, this, there's something deeper going on here. It's a word smash of Bible. The voice from heaven takes two portions of Bible that were pointing towards Messiah and the Father says them about Jesus. God speaks a word in advance and says, when Messiah comes, they will be like. And then the Father affirms the voice that had been given by the Holy Spirit to the prophets. Psalm 2-7, quote, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Without confusing you, David was the great king. And when people thought of the presence of God and the leadership of God in the community, David was like A plus, plus, plus. But there's a father-son relationship. In a sense, that David 
was like the son and that God was like his father, leading him and guiding him to guide God's people. But this was a pointer towards the true son of God, which would be God's Messiah, who would come in the line of David. And so Jesus fulfills in his birth, right? He is from the line of David. And then the voice comes out, you are my son, Psalm 2, 7. The one that's been promised is now come. And the second half, in you I'm well pleased, is from the prophecy of Isaiah 42, 1, quote, Here's my shepherd whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. Speaking of Messiah. I'll put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. And so what you get in the baptism of Jesus is a quiet 400 years of silence. Now, good things happen. God had not forgotten his people. But it was like the calm before the massive storm. When Messiah comes, he will bring justice to the nations, and Jesus is the one on whom God's presence dwells. The glory left the temple, but the glory now has come on the Son. And the voice, the Father, confirms what I was saying in part, I'm now saying in whole, Jesus is who he says he is. Isn't this good news? Now, this is kind of geeky Bible stuff, but we need to remember Jesus is not coming out of nowhere. It is the Holy Spirit who is pointing the spotlight on everything God had said and now pointing the spotlight on Jesus who is baptized. Side note, um, before Jesus does anything, the Father says to the Son, you are my Son and my pleasure is on you. And Jesus had not done anything. He hadn't done any of the miracles. He hadn't done any of his saving work. Uh, Before he does anything, the Father shows pleasure in the Son. And I think this is, practically speaking, a good model for how we see ourselves as children of God. The Father pours out his life and his love over the Son before he does anything because the Father loves the Son. And you and I need to be reminded when it comes to our obedience to Jesus, when it comes to our own discipleship to Jesus, when it comes to our own following of Jesus, we do not do this stuff. We do not walk in obedience like Jesus walked in. We don't live to fulfill all righteousness like Jesus walked and and lived and fulfilled all that was right and good. We don't do that to get the, the Father's pleasure. We are his children, and he loves us. And it's out of the overflow of the son's relationship to the father that he's empowered to do what the father asks of him. And this is the way of Jesus. Remember, to become a disciple to Jesus is to be with him, to become like him, and to do what he did, right? And so in the same way, when you and I, when we start the Christian journey, when we turn from darkness to light, when we are baptized, when we are made new, when we're made whole, And we start this new life with God. Let's start with the right mindset. Uh, God is not looking for us to hit and tick all these boxes and do all these things to eventually love us someday. He loves us. For God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son. And he loves you where you are at. And he loves you deeply, even in your own trouble. So the son could look at John the Baptist and say, you can baptize me. He loves you. He's acquainted with your suffering. He knows your story, and he came to set you free. This is, this is really cool. All right, and, 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 and Luke also gives us Jesus is immediately sent out into the wilderness to be tempted. We'll look at that again next Sunday. All right, one more, and we're done. John chapter 1. Are you with me? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, John one twenty nine. Interesting. John gives us, John is probably the last gospel written. He's probably read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But he gives us the baptism from John the Baptist's perspective. So we've seen it from what Jesus says happened. Now we see it from John. It says, the next day, John, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, this is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me 
has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was so that he might be revealed to Israel. And then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove, notice the next phrase, and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen, I testify, this is God's chosen one. What do we get uniquely from John? Well, we get two things. One, the Spirit came down and remained on Jesus. Second thing, Jesus is going to be the one who's going to immerse, which the word baptize means to immerse, to come under. So baptizing with water is to come under the water. But Jesus is going to immerse with the Holy Spirit. So John uniquely lets us know the Holy Spirit in the time before Jesus, the Old Testament, would come upon people for moments. It would come upon artisans to build a tabernacle. The, the Spirit comes on these craftspeople to, to put together something that's going to honor and, and contain the presence of God. The Spirit would come on the prophets, they would speak. The Spirit would come on the kings, but the Spirit would come on them and then go off and on them and off. But now, Jesus has come, and what we're going to see in the Gospels is the Spirit remains on Jesus, fully, deeply. They're never separated. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are now working in perfect unity and for the rest of the Gospels, what Jesus does is empowered by the Holy Spirit who has come on and remained in him. Why does this matter? Because Jesus is going to tell his disciples, you're going to experience a baptism, and it's not just going to be about water. It's going to be about the same presence, the person of the Holy Spirit who is working in and through me for the salvation of the world, that same Holy Spirit, I'm now going to put you under. He's going to be around you and with you, but now, Jesus says, at the end, when he goes to the Father, he's going to be in you. We're learning, again, we're just building a foundation about the presence of God. God, the Holy Spirit, is working uniquely in Jesus, and he's going to work uniquely in Jesus' people. To be clear, Jesus is the only one who has the fullness of the Spirit without any measure, without any lack. We're leaky. Jesus is not. Okay? So in this perfect way, we're going to see in the rest of the Gospels, you can say, where's the Holy Spirit? Everywhere that Jesus is speaking and moving, he's operating out of the presence of of the Father and the voice of the Father and the work and the empowerment of the Son. Is this a tongue twister? I get it, yeah. But as we move in this series, when we get to the Holy Spirit working within us, this seedbed foundation is gonna build some fruit because this is not a different spirit. This is not a less spirit. This is the same Holy Spirit that is empowering Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that's empowering you. All right, um, Jesus is full of the Spirit. Thank you, John. Thank you for writing the gospel by the leading of the Spirit so that we would remember that. Now, let's just talk about baptism, and we want to respond, and we have one person who's set to be baptized and maybe others here who are ready to be baptized. How is our baptism different and the same as Jesus? This is important. When we see the baptism of John, we're seeing preparation. The baptism of John was about preparation. Remember, John put them under water as a sign that their hearts were being prepared for the coming of the Messiah. So John's baptism is different from ours. And in the same way, you don't see as a primary ministry of Jesus and his disciples baptizing while Jesus is here which is kind of weird because he was baptized, but you don't see that as the primary emphasis. The primary emphasis of Jesus is come, follow me, become my disciple. Why? Because John's baptism 
was leading to Jesus' arrival. And so what's important is that we now follow Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We learn his way. We're with him. We become like him. We do what Jesus did. So John's baptism was about preparation. Our baptism is about declaration. So you don't see a lot of baptism happening while Jesus is teaching, but then Jesus goes to the cross, he pays our sin debt in full, he rises again, and he tells his disciples, I'm going to the Father, and now I'm sending you in the power of the Spirit. Go make disciples of all nations. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go make disciples, baptizing them. And this is interesting. John the bapt- uh, ba- baptizer, B- baptize them for the forgiveness of sins. You're, you're going to follow Jesus. You're going to go his way. Messiah has come. Now, Jesus says, you go, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. So, so whereas before it was a preparation in John the Baptist, now for us, it's a declaration. When we go and share the good news, right, that Jesus died and rose again to save sinners. What is the good news? Jesus, the sinless one, died and rose again to rescue sinners. So everyone who puts their trust in Jesus receives eternal life. And when we share that news and people, by the power of the Spirit, hear that, not as words, but as life. And they recognize, by the way, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the enabling of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit at work in their life, they realize, I need God's life in Jesus. And when they say, yes, Jesus, I receive your life. I want to follow you. Now, our baptism is declaration. What God did through Jesus in the life of that person is now being celebrated and welcomed by the whole community. In our baptism, we declare that we are made new by Jesus. We declare that we have received God's gift of grace. And so let me summarize in a slide. I would invite you to take a photo. If you try to write this down, I will turn it off by the time you're done. Okay? It's just going to take a while, but take a photo of it. In our baptism, we remember and declare to the world, God is now our Father. We've been adopted into his family. My identity, our identity is as a child of God. This is what our baptism is about. God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our Father. Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, great is your name. Jesus is now both Savior and brother. We're united to Jesus Christ. I can and will live in obedience to him because of his sacrifice. I am now a new person and I'm called to live a new life. Yes, Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, but I'm being baptized to say I belong to him and the new life that he's done in me and is doing in me, I now am in allegiance to Jesus and I'm going to follow him with this new life. And then we've received the Holy Spirit, not just power that comes and goes. We are filled by the Holy Spirit who has now come to live with us. We're in our baptism. We're declaring these things are true. Isn't that good news? And maybe when you were baptized, you you weren't even thinking those things. Well, now we get to put words to our belief. Um, We belong to Jesus. And if you you have, have place to trust in Jesus Christ, and you've been baptized in your water to declare that Jesus is the Lord, then you're in good company because going full circle, Jesus was obedient to the will of the Father. So some would say, is baptism necessary? Well, what's essential is that you place your faith and trust in Jesus alone to rescue. That is what saves. But to say that Jesus saved me But like, yeah, Jesus was obedient to the Father, but I'll do what I want is nothing short of stupidity. It's foolishness. And so the person who has been saved by Jesus 
inwardly regenerated. I am new, new creation, new mind, new heart. I can now understand what God is like. I can now walk in his power. I can now live like Jesus. If Jesus was baptized and Jesus told his followers to baptize and have these new disciples or old disciples who have yet to do it declare that you are a son of the Father, that you're united to Christ, that you're filled with the Spirit. Um, let me just put it this way. To love Jesus is to grow in obedience. And baptism, as we see it in the streams of the water and washing, and the streams of the everything pointing to Jesus, in the streams of now Jesus' people going into the water as an act of obedience. You say, does anything happen when I go in the water the answer would be yes, because every time I obey, something happens. Now, if some people have profound experiences of freedom in their water baptism. For others, they go down dry, they come up wet. But every act of obedience has a response and has fruit. And so I would encourage you today, choose to follow Jesus. Uh, you say, well, do I need him? Yeah, of course we need him. Now, just decide today. Lord, thank you for your gift of eternal life. I'm not going to resist it. I'm going to follow you, and I want to receive. And when you receive the new heart, the new mind, the, the, the new creation, then you get to pattern out obedience, just like a Jesus obeyed the Father. You get to step into the waters of baptism which is obedience. And so what's the takeaway? Let me just ask you, what steps of obedience is Jesus leaning in for you? Forget baptism for a moment. Just in general, life and following Jesus is all about obedience. Obedience isn't a negative word. The world wants to redefine. Obedience is restrictive. Do your own. And to that we say, oh, we found a better way. His name is Jesus, and he obeys the will of the Father. And because he does, I am made new. And so I align myself to Jesus. And as his Holy Spirit leads me to particular things. And friend, if you've been awakened and you've been given the new heart, then day by day, moment by moment, week by week, year by year, God is going to keep drilling things in your life for your good. Can I just say, obey Obey. Learn to lean in. Don't resist. Obey. And let me just ask, if he's been pushing on you in areas of obedience, are you taking practical steps to move in that direction? If not, or if you have, this week in our community groups, we've designed it with questions to interact. What does it look like to obey Jesus? And how do we invite the Holy Spirit to participate and empower us in obedience to Jesus. And so that's where the teaching is going to end, but the application is going to begin. Um, we're going to respond with singing in a moment, and we're going to invite you, if you're at home, uh, grab the bread and grab the cup. We're going to celebrate the Lord's meal. Remember, we're united to the Father. We're children of God. We've been invited to the table like we sang about before. We, we have been made close because of the good news of Jesus. We're going to participate in that. We're going to enact that meal, which prepares us for the meal to come. One day we're going to eat with him, with everyone together, and it's going to be filled with joy because we'll all be united in Christ together as God's global family. But until then, we eat the meal. We remember Jesus. We're going to celebrate as well uh, baptism. We have one person, Dave, who came to faith in August, and he wants to declare. But I'm going to invite you when we get up in a moment and we go to the tables, if you need prayer for anything, our prayer team is there in the back. If you would like to be baptized in water, you heard the word of truth, and now you realize God is inviting you to obey. You have been born again, but you have not expressed obedience in baptism. I'm going to invite you not to go to the back, to go right to the water, and some of our pastors and elders will be there. They would love to pray with you, and we'll just, we're going to literally put you right in. And we're going to celebrate your obedience to Jesus. Uh, today, whatever God is inviting us to do, let's take steps of obedience. So let's stand together as God's family. I'm going to invite you now, if you would, uh, to walk and grab the bread and the cup. Don't eat it yet. We want to 
eat it as a meal together, and then come back to your seat. We'll celebrate Dave's baptism and maybe yours, and we'll respond with more singing because Jesus is worthy to be praised.
to be like Christ, don't we? And, and Jesus promised, you will, because he wasn't going to leave you without comfort, without guidance, without direction. And so Jesus, when he pulls his disciples away before he goes to the cross, he lets them in on the power. He says, I'm going to send you the Spirit, and the Spirit on you and in you is going to change everything. And we celebrate that when we think about baptism, that we have been united to Christ, and God is our Father, and we have been given the Spirit, and we can live in obedience to Jesus. But before the meal was done, he took the bread, and he reminded his disciples, you can't do this by yourself. He says, this is my body, broken for you. Do this, eat, and remember me. Today, let's remember the power of Jesus in his death and resurrection as we eat the bread together. on that same night he took the cup and he said this is the cup of the new agreement the old is going to be gone the new has come what Jeremiah promised centuries prior that he would come and give us a new heart a new spirit and this new agreement would be the better way of knowing God it's now happened in and through Jesus and so he invited his disciples to take and drink and he told them this is the blood of the new, uh, of the new agreement that is in me and every time you drink it you're remembering that Jesus, in fact, saves. So let's remember Jesus as we take the cup this morning. And then, like we had said, um, we have Dave, who, who is newer to our church, and um, he's going to be baptized in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. I invite you to stay standing. I think it may be on the screen. If not, I inadvertently lied. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Oh, they should sit down. Sorry, I'm getting real-time instructions. The video camera, your heads are blocking it. <laughs> so just sit for a second. And uh, Dave put his faith in Jesus on August the 5th, 2022 of this year. And he says, I want to be baptized and declare that the true demarcation between my old and new life lies in Jesus Christ and my rebirth in him. I want to declare that when I gave my life to him, that this new life of mine has truly begun. And we celebrate your baptism this morning, David. When he comes out of the water, I want you to rejoice in the goodness of God. invite you to stand again. I know it's sit, stand, sit, church, stand, and let's just go out with a song of praise, because Jesus is the one who truly saves. Amen. Let's sing this together, church. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Yes, He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I
the death that we deserved so that the life that we didn't that we could have that we could be your brothers and your sisters your people God that we could be your children spirit that we might be empowered to just proclaim the goodness of God to the world and so we thank you that we get to gather and encourage one another to push one another towards truth to believing what you have said. And we know that you will move in power through your word in our hearts and in the hearts of those who are seeking, who are hurting, who are lost, who are broken, and maybe just some who are struggling and wrestling. And so I thank you for the space that we can sing together, that you won't fail, you haven't failed, and you're not about to start failing us because your promises are true yesterday, today, and forever. And so we magnify your name, Lord Jesus, and we declare that you are good. And Spirit, we confess that we want to be made more like him. So won't you help us? That we might bear fruit through our lives and in the life of this church, so that your name might be magnified in all the ways that you desire. And so we ask for that, and we say yes. Jesus, in your name, amen. Well, we love you guys. We're really excited about what the Lord is doing. Um, 
just want to remind you guys um, that if you do need prayer, we, we have prayer in the middle of our gatherings, but if you have any sort of a prayer need, um, don't forget to go and see our prayer team. They would love to pray with you. Um, they might even have something that the Lord's stirring on their heart to share over you as you are prayed for. Um, but uh, yeah, we hope that you guys have a fantastic week. Um, do we need help with chairs? Do we know? Chairs, yes. So if you guys wouldn't mind helping, uh, do we, Ryan, do we need these chairs for you? No chairs. So just take them all, stack them all, and guys, we will see you next week. We love you guys.